Thank you, Nick, for the introduction, and thanks to Terrapin for the opportunity to present some of our data here today. So I'm actually replacing Martin Bachmann, our CSO, who unfortunately could not be here today, and I'm going to try and do my best to present it just as well as he would have. So WHO estimates that chronic diseases are responsible for responsible for about half of the deaths worldwide. And number one, cardiovascular diseases, followed by cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. And these are not only problems of the Western world, and most of the deaths actually occur also in low and middle income countries. And WHO thinks one needs to tackle these problems on different fronts. Prevention, of course, is important, but also control and effective intervention. And here, therapeutic vaccination could come in as a convenient intervention strategy. The, in the goal is to induce autoreactive antibodies against disease-causing self molecules and thereby neutralizing disease symptoms. The advantages, of course, of a vaccination approach would be convenience with uh, relatively few applications, compliance of the patient, and also from a cost perspective, it would be relatively economic to do that. So CITUS uh, has uh, developed a strategy to go down this line with, a, as Nick mentioned already, with a virus-like particle approach based on bacteriophages, mainly the bacteriophage Q-beta, we express the code protein of these bacteriophages in E. coli, and they reassemble spontaneously to form the code of the particles. And we then can couple by chemical means any sort of antigens to the particle, and are able to induce strong B cell responses against all sorts of antigens, self molecules, and foreign molecules. We have a C a GMP process uh, in-house to produce uh, these particles with a high yield, and they have been tested in over 20 clinical trials in 1,200 patients, and in all cases have been found to be safe and well tolerated. That's how we produce our vaccines. We use uh, the antigen and couple them with a chemical heterobifunctional cross-linkers to the VLP surface which yields particles that have a highly repetitive uh, display of the antigen on the surface. And this makes them highly immunogenic for several reasons. The repetitive antigen display optimally stimulates B cell responses and leads to B cell receptor cross-linking. The particular nature of the antigens makes them efficient or leads to efficient uptake of the particles by antigen-presenting cells, and the particles can be loaded with toll ligands, like bacterial RNA or CPGs, which further activate dendritic cells. And T-cell hepatopes of the carrier then are able to stimulate B cells that are specific for the target antigen. And this works because tolerance in the B compartment is, is much less stringent than for T cells. And here, T cells specific for the carrier can give help to B cells that are specific for the target antigen. And currently, CITUS has a number of, uh, of targets in preclinical and clinical development. Some programs, like the IgE vaccine for allergies, is partnered with Pfizer. And we have two programs partnered with Novartis that are currently running. One is for Alzheimer, targeting A-beta and nicotine. And we also have two programs targeting foreign antigens and influenza vaccine, partnered with the, with the A-star in Singapore and the malaria vaccine, which, where we just started collaborating with the NIH and the Walter Reed Army Institute. And today I would like, as Nick mentioned already, present some data on the angiotensin hypertension vaccine and an anti-interleukin-1-beta vaccine for inflammatory disease. 
to targeting um, angiotensin for hypertension. Hypertension is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease leading to stroke, heart failure, heart attacks, and almost 30% of people actually have problems with hypertension. And although very efficient drugs actually exist on the market that are also relatively cheap, a health survey in the UK has shown that many people do actually not have efficiently control of their blood pressure. And a vaccination approach could here lead to better compliance in the patients. So this is uh, how blood control works. Renin um, is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen, a precursor of angiotensin 1, which is then further cleaved by angiotensin-converting enzyme to yield the active angiotensin 2 octapeptide. And all three steps can be blocked with marketed drugs, but here to come in with antibodies which block in angiotensin 2 could lead to a more prolonged benefit for the patient. This is how we make the vaccine. We modified angiotensin by adding a cysteid in and a, and a flexible linker, and then conjugated to the particles, which then gives a highly decorated particle with angiotensin peptide. And preclinical results in hypertensive red were r relatively promising, so we went into a phase one study I'm just going to briefly mention, this is all published already, patients with mild to moderate hypertension in a placebo-controlled study. And here what we measured was that blood pressure was effectively reduced after three immunizations with our vaccine. And at week 14, patients were controlled for ambulatory blood pressure. And especially in the in the early morning hours, when blood pressure seems to go up quite a bit, the vaccine was effective in reducing blood pressure here. Then we try to improve on the vaccination regimen, and unfortunately, the study one is uh, what I've just shown you, and we performed a second study where we immunized more often and at shorter intervals in order to give or to reach higher antibody titers that could neutralize angiotensin. And unfortunately, as Nick mentioned already, compared to the study one on the left side, the second study, although the effect was still there, showed that it was uh, less effective. Although paradoxically, we achieved higher antibody titers against angiotensin one, uh, angiotensin two. And so we showed a proof of concept that it's theoretically possible to neutralize angiotensin II and reduce blood pressure in patients. It seems to be critical how you do the immunization to achieve good antibody, not only high enough antibody titus, but also the quality of the antibodies is influenced by vaccination. And we are currently looking a bit closer into that to find out how we can optimize the strategy to get high enough antibody titers of good enough quality. And the second program we have currently running is an anti-interleukin-1 beta vaccine that can be used for inflammatory diseases and diabetes. And this is just a, a short list of diseases which are mediated or thought to be mediated by interleukin-1. And if you look at the red column on the left, this is where it is confirmed. It's really a impressively long list. So interleukin-1-beta is an attractive target. And here we make a whole protein vaccine. So we couple the full interleukin-1-beta protein to Q-beta, a detoxified version of it, because otherwise it's too pyrogenic. And in preclinical studies in the mouse, where we use several inflammatory mouse models, here collagen-induced arthritis and collagen antibody-induced arthritis, which are models for rheumatoid arthritis, show if you compare the full squares, which represent control-immunized mice, 
there they reach a relatively high disease severity. And if you look at the triangles, these are mice vaccinated with the in, and interleukin-1 beta vaccine. They almost completely block the progression of the disease. And this is true for the total clinical scores on the upper panel, as well as for the swelling of the, of the ankles in these mice. The vaccine was also effective in a model of diet-induced diabetes. Mice that were immunized with the vaccine controlled blood glucose levels after an oral glucose challenge much better than control immunized animals. And here we looked also at the quality of the antibody response. And you can see on the left, we did this in a, in a monkey study. After five to six immunizations, we could reach high ELISA titus and tested these antibodies in a cell-based bioactivity assay and saw that uh, we also can neutralize the bioactivity of interleukin-1 in this cell-based assay. And when we purified antibodies from the monkey sera and compared them to the monoclonal anti-interleukin-1 antibody from Novartis that is on the market, you see that the neutralization capacity of our polyclonal sera is very comparable to the neutralization with the monoclonal antibody. So here, the quality of the antibodies we seem to get are of, of uh, marketable quality. And this program is currently in a clinical stage one phase, and the results should come up in the next few months. And this is just to show Cytos is a biotech company in Zurich with 80 employees. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Yeah, just show. When targeting cell proteins, of course, you run the risk of having unregulated immune response. How do you anticipate being able to turn it off? Well, to maintain the immune response, you would need continuous T-cell help. And in this case, all the T-cell help comes from carrier-specific T-cells. And so far, in all cases of targeting self-antigens, we found that as soon as you stop applying the vaccine, then antibody titers go down again. Because uh, you don't have a continued T-cell, and the endogenous antigen is not strong enough to, to stimulate the B-cells on its own. So do you have the potential breaking tolerance, though, don't you, against the self-protein? Sorry, could you repeat that? But you do have the potential breaking tolerance. So once you break tolerance, then you don't need the, you know, the additional T-cell help. In theory, yes. But uh, so far, we observed in all cases that antibody titers go down as soon as you stop applying the, the vaccine where the antigen is coupled to the carrier. So, and, and if you apply again endogenous antigen, it does not affect antibody titers. In, in fact, I'd be asking the opposite question, which is when you gave the vaccine um, more frequently, you, it looked like you got a lower response. So the question is, do you think you're inducing tolerance by giving the, the, administering the vaccine too, too frequently? Well, if we administer, administer it more frequently, usually we get higher antibody titers. But at least for the angiotensin, the quality seems to be different. So it's possible that you just stimulate B cells with a, a lower affinity. But I don't think that you necessarily induce tolerance directly because you still have a strong, a strong TLR stimulus. OK, so if we, oh, one more question. to monitoring your, your antibody responses, so for the example of the angiotensin II response, how do you effectively identify when you make your molecules that you're actually generating targets against neutralizing epitopes as opposed to the general molecule in and of itself? And then when you deal with the expression of these antibodies, in some cases antibodies neutralize, in some cases antibodies enhance the half-life of the target sometimes. Well, this is uh, certainly true. And we found that it depends also on the antigen that you make. Uh, 
yes. for several of these uh, cytokines, you have to use detoxified versions, and there you have to be careful to pick the right antigens, because if you just mutate an important region of the, of the antigen, then you might generate antibodies that just enhance it and don't, have, don't block the, the neutralizing interaction. That's true. You have to be careful selecting the antigens.